This is Amy Park, and this is another episode of Backtable OBGYN. I am so pleased, so honored to have today as our guests, Steve McCarris. Steve is a board certified and internationally recognized OBGYN. I also have on our podcast, Paula Bilica, who is a San Antonio OBGYN with Legacy Women's Health. This podcast is supported by Pacera Biosciences Incorporated. However, Pacera had no control or direction over the final content presented. What, like, why do we even need to talk be, be talking about this? Like, do we need Expiril in gynecologic surgery and OBGYN in general? Sure. So as we know, in the United States, we do have an opioid epidemic and Anything we can do for our patients to provide any kind of pain relief without having to give narcotics, I believe, is in our best interest. For a long time, when I was training, we didn't have this, and we would give, you know, 30 Percocet or whatever to patients after hysterectomies or C-sections. And, you know, especially in, um, not only in hyster- in, in uh, gynecology, but obstetrics, it's really important because patients, you know, if they're having a C-section and they need to take care of a baby, they need to take care of other children having to take opioids is not ideal. And so I think it's really important. And I, when I started utilizing this in my practice, it was a game changer for me to be able to offer this to my patients. Yeah. And Amy, thanks for having us. And it's a pleasure to be here with you as moderating this podcast. It is, it is fun to share experiences among each other. And I learn a lot from my colleagues and try to figure out what they do to enhance patient experience and outcomes. And one of the Biggest problems I always saw was managing post-op pain. And every patient's different, right? You all know that some women can have a hysterectomy and never take a pain pill. It's amazing. It it, it always shocks me. And then when you see some patients, you know, post-operatively really require a lot of analgesics, whether it's a minimally invasive hysterectomy or an open hysterectomy or a C-section. I guess we haven't figured out how to do a minimally invasive cesarean section yet, but I have a surgical practice, and about seven years ago in the state of Florida, there was a big program through the state on reducing opioid exposure, and I do about 25 hysterectomies every month, and I was a high opioid prescriber, and I realized I needed to do something to address the issue, and I got exposed to uh, bupivacaine, liposomal bupivacaine is what Expiril is, and I really didn't understand much about it and didn't know how to use it, so I reached out and tried to figure it out and saw that there was actually some good data around Expiril and other specialties, like in orthopedics, in hemorrhoidectomy and bunionectomy, the original trials with Expiril, these phase three trials were pretty remarkable. I mean, I've never had a bunionectomy or a hemorrhoidectomy, and I hope I never do, but the, the reduction of opioid exposure and the recovery was pretty impressive. And that was really early on before we had good data on cesarean. And, and, and I'm sure Paula knows, and Amy, you probably know, there's really been some and most of them came out of Texas, Paula and uh, Dallas. And, you know, that, that C-section data was pretty impressive. But prior to that, there wasn't a whole lot of data around gynecology. So I was prescribing a lot of opioids and realized I needed to do something to change. So I learned about Expiril, uh, a unique formulation that gives a delayed delivery of the pivocaine into soft tissue, and it's indicated for soft tissue of any type. It's also indicated for uh, some of these, which I don't know much about, but some of these brachial plexus, shoulder surgeries, and other types of blocks in, in orthopedics. It's used a lot in orthopedics. So we mobilized the, the team and tried to figure out if Expiril would be worthwhile and it was pretty expensive to use back then. It's gotten much better, and now there's a lot of contracting to allow us to use it more freely. But it was indicated on any open search, exploratory laparotomy, TAH, is open myomectomies. And back then, I couldn't find an anesthesiologist that would do a tap block, a transabdominus plane block. And 
Paul, you probably had the same experience early on. And there's been a really wonderful educational opportunity in, with anesthesia. Now anesthesia will do a tab block. And a tab block is a regional block, as you all know. That really has been a huge, huge help in cesarean section post-op pain uh, management, as well as open hysterectomy and open myomectomy. And it now has moved into these multimodal pain management uh, protocols. Uh, the American College of OBGYN, the ERAS Society, the American College of Oncology all endorse some type of mechanism to manage post-surgical pain other than opioids. So it really has moved into a viable option. And you can either do it through a tap block that anesthesia does, either prior or after your procedure. Of course, with cesarean section, you can't do it until after the baby's delivered. Well, they'll take liposomal bupivacaine and do a regional block, and it works wonderful. Or you as the surgeon, and this is where I'd like to hear what you all do, but you can do soft tissue infiltration where you do volume expansion. Expiral comes in a 20 ml valve. So you have 20 mLs and you can volume expand that with normal saline and bupivacaine or uh, hydrochloride bupivacaine or what we know as marcaine. And maybe, but Paula, do you use marcaine with yours? I usually do the 20 of... Uh of the Expro, and then I do 30 of the Marcaine and 30 of saline. So that gives me 80 cc's to kind of work with, you know, a volume. So if I do a local, you know, a local infiltration myself, if my, my anesthesiologist for some reason is not able to do the tap block. So what that is, is that's called ad mixing, where you can mix hydrochloride, the Pivacaine, which is a fast acting, short duration analgesic. And every OB, every OBGYN has used Marcaine our whole careers, right? Uh, and, and so you take Marcaine, add, mix it with Expiril, 30 to 20, that's 50 cc's. And then you have the capability to volume expand that out to a total of 300 cc. So you have plenty of Expiril to do soft tissue infiltration. And one of my aha moments uh, using Expiril and I think we've all kind of had those on a left Bartholin's gland excision that I did, which I, you know, I hate, I, I hate that operation. Ugh, I hate those. Yeah. Those are not my favorite at all. I send them to Your my Euro guys. Local, uh, <laughs> yeah. lovely Euro guys. That's so funny. <laughs> or my GYN Ox. Yeah. Uh, after 20 years, I was like, I'm done. I remember hearing about x from the colorectal surgeons doing combo cases and, you know, the hemorrhoidectomies, they were telling me that the patients would come in 72 hours, like on the dot, when the x would wear off because they were experiencing no pain. And then all of a sudden they were having routine post-op pain and they, they, they thought something was wrong, like the sutures had had uh, broken down or something like that. And and they are very facile with doing the fascia, that's the technique, right? Is is injecting it along the fascia or do you do it along the skin and the subcutaneous tissues? Well, you really want to block the ileolingual and iliofemoral and iliogenital nerves that run down the rectus abdominis, right? So if you're doing a C-section or an open case and you're doing soft tissue infiltration, you, th there's a couple of unique things about Expiril because it's encapsulated by a liposomal multivesicular envelope, right? So it's, it, the, the, the pivocaine is encapsulated. And depending on where you inject it, the blood supply to that site, it'll break down that liposomal covering and then the, the, the pivocaine, you know, infiltrates into the tissue. So you really, if you're doing soft tissue infiltration, you really want to do a good bathing of the fascia, below the fascia, above the fascia. So you want to inject below and above the fascia to bathe the fascia completely. Every centimeter you do an injection. It's not like Marcaine. Marcaine, we put in the needle, aspirate, and infiltrate, and it flows into the field. This is a different molecular weight, and there's millions and millions of these encapsulated particles you're injecting. So it has a tendency to kind of stay where you put it. 
So you want to be you want to be overzealous and really do a lot of infiltration below the fascia, above the fascia to hit those nerves. But the good thing is, I mean, how often do you all do an operation that that a patient seventy two hours out has moderate to severe pain? I mean, that's kind of unusual, right? No, not very often. And I tell my patients, I say, you know, this last up to 72 hours, sometimes longer. You know, I've had patients 72 to 96 hours with the Expirel, and I'll tell them your peak pain is around 48, 24, 48 hours, especially with the C-section and with my robotic hysterectomies. And I said, so if we can get you that far out without narcotics, controlling your pain, you're probably good. Maybe just a little Motrin if you need it, you know, be a little sore at that point. But you're right. You're not going to have any more severe pain and I do the same thing you do with the, when I do my C-sections, I will, because like, like Dr. McCara said, you, you, uh, the, it stays where you put it. So I f- do in a fan-like fashion at the corners, um, above and below the, the fascia, and then I'll go along above and below the fascia across the, the incision, and then into the muscle and into the sub-Q a little bit with my extra what's left over. So uh, we talked about it for open surgeries. It sounds like, you know, the TAH is the C-section, the fan and steels, do you guys use it for slings or for laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery for the incisions? Do you, is there like any utility in that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I use it on all my uh, robotic hysterectomies and robotic surgeries. I'll infiltrate into the port sites around the fascia and then we will you know, place it along, like, just like we said, we put it where we want it. We try to get the, and we try to inject and get those nerves that are going to cause the pain. And then some of my GYN oncologists that are at my hospital now are injecting into the um, vaginal cuff. And I don't know if Dr. McCarris, do you do that? And the way I think about it, any soft tissue infiltration, there's an application. So I really like it for the vaginal cuff because, because if you think about, you know, tissue injury, in the healing of tissue, that's what it's visceral pain and somatic pain, right? So this, if you do, if I do an open, here, here's what I have found. I kind of do the, there's no data on this and I don't know if it's reasonable. I think it is, but Expiril will volume expand to 300 mLs. You don't dilute the ability of the micros, uh, the uh, uh, liposomal bipivacaine to dilute. It doesn't dilute it. You get the effect. So anesthesia will do a tab block, and they use 30 cc's on each side, and they'll bring in an ultrasound machine, and they'll scan the transverse muscle and the the peritoneum, and they'll do a guided infiltration, right? They'll use 30 cc's on the right side and 30 cc's on the left side. Well, that's 60 cc's. So if I do an open multiple myomectomy, which I do, I still have 240 cc's of Expril that I can infiltrate. So I'll let them do the tap block. I'll do soft tissue infiltration of the abdominal wall. And then what I do that I have found, I think it helps. There's no data on this. This is just anecdotal. I'll actually inject the uterus with Expril where I've cut into the uterus and caused tissue injury and tissue trauma on a myomectomy. And I'll do, I'll do organ infiltration for visceral pain, myomectomy, posterior repair, anterior repair. Back to my Barflins. I know we hate Barflins, but I'm telling you, my, my aha moment with Expiril was a young girl that I did a left excision of a Barflins gland, which we all hate. We know it's painful. It's bloody. It's a terrible operation. And I infiltrated the whole surgical field with Expiril. And no kidding, zero post-op pain. One of our Euro guys here at this hospital had bilateral mastectomy and in, uh, infiltrated Expril. I know her well. I've known her for 25 years. She said, Steve, I had zero post-op pain. So any soft tissue surgery, you can apply Expril to that location. And, 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 the, and the thing is, I mean, it can't hurt and it only can help. Your chronic pelvic pain patients, 18% of endometriosis patients are treated with opioids that to handle their pain. And now you got to operate on that patient. So you really have to set the stage with patient shared decision making, if you will, that I'm not going to give you 30 Percocets. We're going to use a medication to do, to reduce post-surgical pain. Remember, the studies really show that there was, I think, what was it, uh, Paula, maybe you remember, I think it was 40 
a 45% reduction of opioid consumption, reduction of pain with Expiril. I mean, the data is there. So I think if you talk to your patient about what you're doing prior to the surgery, the whole goal in, 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 we see in the C-section data, an, an Expiril tap block C-section patient, the Foley's out, the IV's hep block, she's not getting IV Demerol or morphine or what have you. She's up, she, and you can breastfeed. The, the plasma concentration of Expiril and breast milk is less than, what is it, Paula, 1%? It's less than 1%, so it's, it's safe in breastfeeding, so my patients love that as well. And, you know, my hysterectomies go home the same day, um, which I'm sure yours do too, and, and it's really nice because they don't have any pain and they don't need to take their narcotics. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast rate it five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version has and Yvonne Ovrijinsky. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.